Sure. All right, we are live. Uh, welcome back to the MTI podcast. We've got Rob Kelson and myself, Charlie here. Uh, Rob's coming to us live from Oregon's finest McDonald's establishment right now. Um, seems like an appropriate place to discuss quiet professionalism. Uh, so I think this concept's been around for the better part of a decade now. Um, and as we were just talking about a moment ago before recording, kind of outside of our box as a strength and conditioning company, uh, but it's also gotten on quite a bit of traction. We get emails on this stuff all the time. So to kind of start things off, Rob, curious on where this concept came from, how how it originated, and also the process and deciding to actually publish it. I was kind of thinking about that um, years ago. A, a guy came from uh, the first uh, programming course I gave was Fort McGill or McGill Air Force Base in Tampa. And then a guy brought me in there. Uh, I met with there were only like five people in the course and all were pretty high powered, especially in the soft community. I think that's SOCOM headquarters or something like that. But anyway, the guy brought me in there was a uh, Master Sergeant Green Bray, and we kind of talked back and forth every once in a while, and every once in a while the idea of why a professional came up. I'm not too sure where the term came from, uh, but uh, it had been associated with Special Forces guys on the Army side, especially as I understand it, Green Berets and Delta guys. And uh, anyway, we were talking about that, and, uh, and I just started thinking about that term and that idea and understanding that there's nothing about being in the middle. You know, it's not like the Army, or, <laughs> you know, the Green Berets own that term. And anybody I thought could be a quiet professional. And then one started to put some more thought to it, and then and I think the yeah, first thing to do is kind of define this, you know, what it means to be a quiet professional. And I was also at the time, I think, uh, I can't remember what this was, but MTI was getting, or military athlete was getting pretty well known, and I was, you know, getting asked to do podcast interviews and you know, with magazines and stuff, and I wasn't super comfortable doing that. And uh, some of the other strength coaches at that time were kind of getting into that world big time, and, uh, and uh, I didn't, I just wasn't comfortable doing that. Um, uh, for, for many reasons, um, but uh, those two things kind of came together and I kind of wanted to start defining, in my own mind, you know, what it was to be a quiet professional and understand that uh, I didn't do this because I am one. <laughs> I think uh, my my goal was kind of, you know, set a definition out there for people to aspire to. I don't think anybody's perfect and uh you know, maybe the only perfect flat profession for Jesus and Muhammad and those kind of guys. So uh, uh, that's kind of what I want to do is to set some ideas out there to aspire to and, and get down the definition. So that's kind of where it started. And uh, I kind of wrote, I, I, you know, I put some uh, thoughts to paper and kind of wrote the first uh, essay on it and uh, just published it in their newsletter on the website. And uh, yeah, I got quite a bit of feedback on it. A lot of people were um, certain certain people it seemed like like this idea of how to how to go about work. Did you get any uh, any negative feedback on it? I don't remember getting any negative feedback on it. Um, so no, and I don't know that people who had negative thoughts about it would respond. So I imagine there was some some out there, but I didn't get any. It was all positive what I received. How uh, we haven't quite defined it yet. So, how would you define the quiet professional topic? Well, just like everything that you know, we kind of do is uh, keep on refining and and crunching it down. And my definition keeps getting shorter and more focused. And uh, right now, you know, the working definition is uh, quiet professional means. Um, Commitment to the mission and craft without self-promotion. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. 
Um, so that's that's the working definition I'm working with right now. Rob, can you so we could define go ahead, self promotion? Well, if you think if you think about the word, just this is the term quiet professionalism. There's two two words there, and the first word is quiet. And uh, it's you know that term quiet professional is pregnant with meaning. There's lots of meaning to it. Um, so yes, uh, self promotion is um, not super influenced by the military early on and with the Coast Guard Academy and then spent years in the, the military and uh, and in the military, especially in the officer ranks. Um, it's uh, pretty severe up and out, and the competition is always there between you and your colleagues. And, and part of that means that uh, to be successful, um, you have to. Well, there's there's an incentive to you know position yourself um, to work for the you know. Like, in other words, maybe in the military side to, to go to ranger school, not because you want to be a ranger, but because you wanted to tab, because that would, on your shoulder, it would mean other people think different about you, that, that kind of thing. There are equivalents, you know, in every, every military branch. Um, and in the, uh, you know, I think this is, I think it's rare. In fact, I thought a lot about the organizational, uh, makeup of what, what an organization would look like that really promoted quiet professionalism, but most organizations don't, right? Um, uh, they, they promote um, self-advancement uh, and advancement a lot of times is made by, you know, self-promotion, either picking assignments that'll get you noticed and or doing things that'll get you noticed or doing your own self-promotion. I mean, every resume is a self, you know, it's a self-promotion, right? Every CV. Um, so yeah, that, uh, the self-promotion in the military is really evident because unlike in the corporate world, you know, where you'll see the CEO of a large organization, you know, that person isn't dressed in an ornate uniform that is full of blame like our military leaders. It's, it's a really ridiculous. So I think the military especially, you know, has this idea of you know, self-promotion is, it really kind of pushes that. So. Anyway, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's kind of how I define it. Kelson, can no, I? No, I think you did. Can I ask you, Kelson? So you, you did. You've done twenty years. Did you see instances of that? Because I've I've done military time and I've done corporate time. I can't say that I really saw that, uh, at least at the level that I was at, which is low. You know, kind of the tactical level for my four or five years in, um, I didn't really see much self-promotional behavior at all. Did you see that much, or did you have to do any of that kind of to to work your way up the ranks through the twenty years? Um, well, I guess, I guess you'd have to separate like um, taking initiative versus self-promotion because a lot of times when you take initiative and you want to advance something. Um, you almost have to do some promotion that goes along with it just to get the ball rolling and, uh, you know, to get your idea across, or maybe if you're starting a, a program and, and you want to get traction. So you do have to do some self-promotion. Um, and a lot of times that, that can lead into, um, you know, your, your annual evaluation or your fit rep report, you know, a lot of that, um, it, it can happen like that, but I don't know. I don't know if it's in a negative way all the time. Um, but of course, there's always some self promotion that's purely for just the individual. But um, I, th I think there just has to be there has to be like a separation. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So, do you think self promotion and promoting a program you're working on? is the same thing. Um, I think it can have similarities, but um, there's probably uh, different intents 
just, I mean, you can get promoted just because you're doing a, a good job and you're promoting something. Um, and then you can, you can also take it from an individualistic um, point too. So. Rob, where have you seen, do you have any examples of like concrete examples of the self-promotional issue within the military? Yeah, I can just think back to, uh, you know, my academy days. And uh, you know, I can also, I guess, push this over to West Point, too. I spent a semester at West Point. At the Coast Guard Academy, they had, you got um, graded on academics, which is purely your GPA. And then uh, you had a class rank. And you also got graded on, on and that class rank was based on your academic score and your military score. And, uh, and then if you, I think if you're in the top 10% of either, you got to wear a star. And so the, the military um, star for top 10% was silver and the academic one was gold. And so we all look the same. We all wore like, you know, in the winter, this dark blue uniform, blue tie, everything was the same. And, uh, and then people who were cadets who were in the spring for the wear you know, one or two stars. And um, and the same as the two at West Point. I can't remember what it was, but it was the same type of class rank thing. If you got your certain percent, of, you, you wore a star or some emblem on your collar. And um, and I guess and I, I always wore my star. You know, I had two stars for my entire academy. <laughs> there was this one instance where me and this other guy in the Coast Guard Academy was like all the other academies were in the, in the summer, you you know, you'd go home for two weeks and the rest of the time you're kind of out on the feet doing stuff. And then this other guy, you know, another classmate, were sent to a small little station in like Duluth, Minnesota, a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, the enlisted guys there certainly noticed that on my uniform, I wore my stars and the other guy did it. And when I say the concrete example is, I don't think there was any mandate that I wore my stars. You know what I mean? I don't think I had to wear them. And I, I think I I wonder why I wore them. You know, was I proud of them or did I want to show other people, you know and this is true in the military, I don't I don't know if there's a military requirement that you need to wear every ribbon you have. I mean in the military you get ribbons just for doing your job. You know, I got two medals for just kind of doing my job. <laughs> that happens a lot. We're just being there. You know, there's nothing like that in, <laughs> in the corporate world to get money, right? But in the military, it's just, it's just really weird to get it. And so it's a, it's a visual, obvious display of self-promotion, obviously. So, yeah, that would be a, a concrete example. And I, I guess I look back, I'm like, why did I, why did I feel the need to wear those stars, right? And why did I feel a need? I kind of saw, you know, other people did know, they judge people because they had them stars. Just like, you know, I think we've been, there was an essay recently, maybe last year or something, but on ranger cats. You know, you should wear a ranger cab on uniform. He's on MTI, one of the essays that we've done. And, and the officer who wrote it, you know, he would judge guys, you know, whether or not they had officers or not they had a ranger cab on. And, uh, you know, and I can tell you right now in the Army that having a ranger tab is a, you know, on your shirt is, a, is you know, not a neck that sets you apart from your colleagues in terms of being an officer. And so there is a self promotion to, you know, just because you got a ranger scope, I don't know that you need to wear your ranger tab. So that's just kind of a, you know, kind of example, like, you know, your, what is it, your seal trident, right? Uh, Kelson. Right? I mean, is there a requirement that when you go to another base, you get a very seal credit? No. You know, because obviously people judge you and they see that. Did you ever know a seal who went to the base and you didn't want to get it? it? Now, that, that would be the exception. Yeah, I try to just avoid wearing all uniforms, really. And that's, you know, that's big boy rules, but do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know if there's the same thing in on the Marine side, um, 
you know, understand Marine culture, like you do Charlie, but I don't know if there's anything significant, but I can tell you in the Army, it's, you know, I've never been in the Army, but like the Southwest Point, Tampa County, and we, you know, we've had career on there, so it's like that for us, right? So, what I got to do is look at the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they look ridiculous. <laughs> and that's what all the other, you know, if you're, if you're a lieutenant in the Army and you want to be a first star general and see how they look, is that what you aspire to? It looks ridiculous, right? So, you know, but, you know, that quiet part is, is, uh, you know, that self promote. And as I, as I started to think about that, that if you, you don't have to worry about self promotion, that, that it can be really liberating. And that when you think about, you know, the mission first element of it, if you're only worried about the mission and you're not worried about, yourself in terms of career advancement or getting credit. Um, it can be really liberating. You'll make decisions in terms of promoting the mission for your work. Um, that frees up mind space and anxiety and jealousy and envy and all that other crap that comes along with self promotion. So it can be liberating. So I guess that's a good segue into the mission first component of it um can you give a summary of that Rob? what are your thoughts are there well the idea was that if you're working for an organization or a craft all that matters is in the success of the organization or i guess in this sense the organization so what's the mission and put the mission first ahead of you your own achievement or self promotion. And um and that's just that can be a significant change. In other words, sometimes you can work hard to be successful at work, not because you want or your job, not because you want to to contribute towards the mission success for the organization, um, but because you want to be recognized for, for that and then you know, promote it up the chain or be recognized by your colleagues, or whatever it is. I think that happens a lot. Um, and I think that is actually the standard. Uh, and, you know, you do, you work hard, not, not because uh, you, uh, you want to do the best for the mission at your job, but you, you want to be recognized for it and get more money or get the dance for just, you know, the social benefit of being recognized as a high achiever. And I think that the, uh, uh, when that, when you turn specifically towards the mission, I get, I guess, you know, step back. When you're doing that, you do make decisions in terms of work and what you put time and what you do and what you put emphasis on. That is, if not wholly, partially influenced by what's best for you. And the, what's best for you may not always be best for the, the mission. So, for example, in a, maybe uh, at a uh, um, at a job where best for you would be moving up the links, you know, but it turns out that you're really good in your current role and you're essential in your current role. And if you take the promotion, then the mission is going to decline. There was a uh, there was a, a fire a firefighter I, I spoke to you about this, and we we did this. Um, kind of remote scrum or quiet professional uh, series a couple of some wonders ago. And there were a group of several groups of four people that I kind of moderated. And one of the guys was a professional, you know, career fireman. And he described how he had taken over a, he was a captain, he took over a low performing station. And he, you know, was working on getting fit and, uh, you know, uh, and getting it, bringing it up to standards, and and, uh, and he was really enjoying it. But because of his success at the station, he got offered another station, which was like a special operations fire station. Where him at his album, it was like the, the busiest station in the city, you know, a much more you know, higher profile job. And he and he took that job, where it says, you know, in hindsight. I should have stayed at the station I was at because we had, you know, really start to do some good things. So those are, I guess, 
the example of the mission first. I, I thought about this a lot. I don't think that putting mission first is good for the career best. Uh, because you may make you know, conscious decisions that will not be best for your career at a good cost you. You know, promotions, you, you, you may be offered a promotion and then decide not to take it. You know, like I think there was one of the, one of the generals recently, can't remember who it was, but the story was that this, uh, you know, as a major or something, he went to Delta Selection from the Lion Army, got selected for Delta and decided to stay in the line, you know, with his unit in the regular army. I think that would be another example of maybe mission first. Those are a couple of examples. Do you think your uh, your personality influences these ideas? You're so you're a self described introvert, right? So self promotion isn't going to come naturally to you. So do you think this is a route around personality traits? As you wrote it. Uh, yeah, I know there's plenty of uh, introverts who are high achievers and they are very successful. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, I think uh, this is a just uh, a conscious decision to to work to put mission first in your in your work at the expense or possible expense of your own. Um, you know, or what could come to you in terms of money or promotions or whatever. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with personality. I think that's a values choice. Um, so, yeah, I think just because you're an extrovert doesn't mean you need to be self-promotional. So I'm not too sure. I guess I'd have to do more details about what introverts and extroverts are. Um, I know that in, in general, that the bar scenario is how I understand it. But like I've always been really uncomfortable in bars. Like, uh, I read this book called Quiet, and she's about introverts, and she's the person who explained that to me. And just because uh, introverts are naturally sensitive to social stuff, and so if there's too much social stuff going around, the people in crowds are moving out of the It makes you uncomfortable. I was always uncomfortable. And then extroverts like that, that distraction and that, all that, uh, action around them. Yeah. So I think those are two separate things. Um, I think that aspiring to be a, a quiet professional and putting mission first isn't, I mean, you have to start to with intent, but the only thing that counts is action, right? So what decisions are you making in, in your everyday work? Work stuff. You're putting mission first that are actually putting the mission first. Uh, and uh, if you just think, you just you know, if you're not making taking action to deal with it, then it doesn't matter. Intent is secondary. That's the challenge and conflict here, right? It's like particularly if you're working within a larger organization, as Kelson was mentioning, like you got to promote or at least be able to effectively brief a program or initiative, whatever you're trying to do, that may be for the betterment of the organization, but you still have to kind of get outside of this box of, uh, you know, I'm just going to grind through and, and do really good work on this project. But if there's other stakeholders involved, then you have to do, in order to make it happen, you have to do an effective job of communicating what's needed, you know, whether that's manpower, financial support, et cetera. So there's a, there's a conflict there, right. That is going to be hard to, to overcome, or perhaps it's just part of part of the process of developing an initiative. through. Yeah, I'm not, sure. No, I'm not sure. I think, I think that uh, quiet professionals are uh, often taken for granted. So they're like the, you know, they're like the, the offensive line on a great offense, right? Um, uh, they just do their job and they uh, they don't get the, the attention, but they are essential to what's going on. Um, and I think that you'll see 
just in your everyday life, you'll see this. You'll see the, you know, you'll see the, you know, the clerk at the convenience store who remembers your name and, you know, just is, does a crap at that job or, you know, the, the counter lady at the airline counter who can take your messed up flights and figure it out for you really quick. You know, another struggle. And they just do it and they seem surprised when they say, I appreciate you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think flight professionals are in our, you know, daily life. But yeah, there is a, you know, there is this conflict. I, I, I'm not sure that I've tried to, I've written about the organizational changes that need, that would need to happen to really promote flight professionals. And, and how do you, or reward quiet professionals in general, you, you know, quiet professionals don't want a medal, right? They don't want to necessarily be recognized <clears throat> publicly. Um, and so where I'm at right now is that you know, quiet professionals, um, we aspire, really want, you know, a, autonomy to do their job, two things, autonomy to, to do their work, and second, the ability to have impact on the mission. I think those are two things that uh, someone aspires to be a flight professional really wants from their organization. Is autonomy to do their job. You know, that comes in a trust, you get approved that you're trusted. You know, the ability to impact, you know, to see their work to, to impact the mission success. Those are the two things I think we're doing. I haven't, we actually, as part of that, that remote scrum, we've tried to organize we try to identify organizations that uh, or cultures that were um, recognized quiet professionals and how they were recognized. And one of the participants, this woman was a, you know, a tech leader. She had gone to uh, you know, a military academy and, and, uh, and she had also spent some time fishing up in Alaska, commercial fishing. And uh, she said, yeah, that everybody kind of knew the, the boat. Was it, like I did some a couple weeks of commercial fishing up in Bristol Bay, Alaska. And so it's salmon fishing, and so the season is really congested and short. But there were certain boats. Uh, she described, she did something similar. She said there were certain boats every year that uh, consistently brought in the most catch. And uh, they were consistent, but they never, you know, they didn't self-promote at all. You know, everybody just kind of knew that they were the boats that did it, and it was consistent every year because there was a culture, a leadership, or something that both attracted the same type of people who just kicked grass all the time. So there was no, like, organizational award to it. It was just kind of wrong. Uh, you know, I, as we, as we think about uh, the special forces example, you know, SEALs are in the news all the time and Delta hardly is. Uh, so it's just a, I think there's some cultural differences between those two organizations uh, that kind of come, you know, come back to this idea of it. I think that's a, that's an easy, cheap, maybe example. I'm still, you know, looking Most quite professionals, and then to go in, said you two, you two guys in there, we've actually done a study like this on organizational, you know, we did a, a, a study on the organizational uh, uh, traits to find that organization. I said you guys in there to do a study on it, try to find out like what what made it different, what made it too. I'm going to ask you a question. A little bit. I mean, it's just a, it's a challenge, right? Particularly, I think if you're working in any, even just small business, you know, to mid business, mid sized business, even at a squad level to battalion to regiment, whatever the case may be, there's obvious conflicts in terms of getting things done effectively when it's not a, individual contributor kind of position right <clears throat> everything everything in 
a business, everything in the military requires the assistance and work of other folks. And usually in order to get that off of the ground requires some kind of promotion in order to get the ball rolling. And Kelsey was you know, talking I, about I would this. challenge that. It's a, it's a challenge. I would challenge that idea. And I think that that's part of the game, right? That's part of the self-emotional. You want to make a change. You know, that's part of promoting yourself as a person who wants to make a change. So you want to do this big presentation to your command to get these resources, you know, to be partly, you know, get the change done, partly be recognized for the guy who really wants to make the change. Right? And uh, I think a lot of times some of those changes can occur without anybody knowing. You can just do them. Uh, the example I have is um, I thought a lot about creating a fitness culture at first responder units. And I've had the same conversation with probably a dozen frustrated police or firemen, um, generally mid-career people who want, who want to bring you know, fitness to their unit. And um, the conversation is, you know, they, they want to put together a presentation for the command to get some funding, you know, and do this other stuff so they can get some equipment. And I thought, well, why don't you just start, you know, training, and, you know, bringing your own equipment and just start doing it. And, and they don't understand that that's all they, <laughs> that's all it takes. The, the mission or the, the goal is to get fitness started. It's not to get command support, you know, to do it. In fact, that could be the slow way to get it done. In my mind, a quiet professional would, would kind of make it happen, you know, kind of organically, um, or work to do it just to get it done. The mission, the mission is success, or the, the goal is to increase this, you know, fitness at the unit. So one way is to go get a, do a presentation to the command, and then it's up to the command whether or not it happens or not. And if they don't get the feeling from the command from the command, then they don't do it. Whereas you know, a quiet professional might just, you know, just start doing it within his or her own meaning and really not ask a man for anything and you know, start to get it done. Um, so uh, I had this one military officer tell me that obstacles are, you know, sometimes I see these obstacles as you know, breakdowns and I've always seen, and he, he said, you know, there's like a three inch, you know, like a three foot fence you can step over and go around. And I see obstacles as opportunities to improve our thinking. Um, anyway, that's, that's just a couple examples. I said, I disagree with you, Charlie, that you know, if you're a junior officer of some unit and you want to make a change, you need to go get your command approval by doing a PowerPoint presentation. You know? I mean, who cares? I mean, what happens if you make the change without asking permission? You, you know, maybe you don't get, you get a knock on your OER. Well, if you improve the mission success, who cares? Right? So, um, I think that this is just, I guess I disagree with that, that idea, but I think you can do a lot of that. I guess I would say that black professionals who really inspire to us are able to make significant improvements in mission success without anybody noticing it, without bringing attention to themselves by requiring demand approval. Yeah, that's a, that's a cultural example, though. I mean, what if you're giving a tangible example, uh, a sniper has done a significant amount of research into a particular kind of round and has determined for whatever their operating environment is, this round is a, is a better selection for that area. That's not something that they can make a change on necessarily themselves. Maybe I'm wrong on this example, but cultural changes can be set by example right which is a really good opportunity for kind of this quiet professional thought but if you're doing a program change on a tangible uh product or whatever the case may be that's going to require buy-in right which is going to in inevitably require some sort of briefing because there's financial there's financial aspects tied to that Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I guess the way that, uh, 
that that person may, you know, act in that stance is to go back and say, well, am I doing everything that I can do to improve mission success with my current equipment? Do I need to really need a change in equipment? You know, if, if that person gets shut down or or whatever in terms of the, the change like that. I think it's easy to say you need something new and different. And the more difficult thing is to say, let's work with it. Yeah, instead of out of box thinking inside the, I think the, the most creative and effective thinking comes inside the box, not outside the box. What can we do inside the box? And so that person, that sense is what can I do inside the box of what I have? And how can I, you know, make it, you know, make the mission success better you know, with the tools I have to work with? You know, different application of those tools, that's, that's a real challenge instead of the easy ticket sometimes, which is I need a new gun and a new round. Uh, I think that that comes maybe a little too quickly, but I mean I don't know if we're moving from organizational, you know, from an individual wants to aspire to be a quiet professional or um, you know organizational approach. There, those are two different things. I think that the, I would say that that aspire to be a quiet professional for most organizations is not good for your career. Yeah, I just, I mean, this is an internal decision that you make that, that in terms of being good for your career is, you know, I mean, not lead to promotions or a bunch of more money or a bunch of medals on your chest. Uh, there's something else that you value. Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying if, if sometimes if you are a quiet professional, um, people are going to do your self promotion for you, whether you like it or not. Um, for, for instance, um, in the Navy, they got things like Sailor, the Quarter, um, you know, just different awards for performance. And it's not necessarily on that junior guy, whether he, uh, like if he gets put up for it, being a quiet professional, like he's just going to get the recognition whether he likes it or not. So um, sometimes guys don't have, it's out of their control because more senior guys want them recognized and and it just happens like that. Um, I guess one thing I'd be curious about, Rob, is like you've been running businesses for 30 or 40 years. And like within that, like in in a marketing sense there, have you ever had to do some kind of self-promotion to get your businesses off the ground? Yeah, and we can... We can- you know, Charlie knows this, we struggle with how to do this. You know, in the fitness world, the model is pretty clear. You know, either, you know, super jack guys working out their shirts off or, you know, super jack women working out in really tiny you know, clothes. <laughs> you know, you know, promoting stuff and uh and we've always you know, struggled with how can we how can we do marketing and I still be quite professional. And so yeah, that's a line that we think about a lot. We we consciously try to make the decision of not to uh, always to put I mean a marketing which might lead to money is not worth giving up our value of aspiring to be quite professional. So the second thing I say is that I've only started thinking about this recently, I guess, in my, my career, maybe the last 10 years. So <laughs> certainly, you know, like when I was a cadet, I was all about wearing my fucking stars and my shirt, right? So uh, I think this is something I've kind of moved to later in my work life. The, the thing about being a quiet professional, though, is it's an ideal that anybody can aspire to at any level of the Team. You could have, you know, a, a, a company, you know, a company of the armor, you know, an army or a marine or whatever, or, you know, a station, fire department or a police department, you know, uh, force. And the, the only guy who's a quiet professional on that force would be the, you know, maybe one of the most junior guys who's just been a couple of years. So there's no like level of, uh, Work achievement or 
whatever which you need to be before you kind of become this, right? You can do, you can aspire to this, I guess, a work ethic, no matter where you are, contribute to, which is liberating too, what you choose that necessarily to do. Um, yeah, so, I, and I would say that I've made many non quite professional decisions and done things that, uh, you know, in hindsight, I wish I hadn't done. And I, and I think that when I was doing them, I was always a little bit uneasy. But the on the other side, that's the way. I mean, the idea of being a quiet professional is not the norm. The norm is not to be it's to be self promotion. You know, for example, we had a uh, let me give you an example that that uh, you know specific to NTI North Base approached us and they were moving to develop fitness clothing. They wanted to move into the athleisure clothing. And uh, we were unique at the time in Mountain Athlete in terms of developing and working with Mountain Athletes and the design program for Mountain Events. And, we, um, and, uh, and they approached us and we were all over. I was about, you know, this part of the North Face really kind of moving us. You know, seeing, you know, maybe, I don't know, you know felt like a great feather in a cap big company and uh and so we kind of went into it and i kind of had you know some standards i wanted to see happen but as part of that they would send some of the professional office to you know take photo shoots in the gym where in their athletic leisure but these professional athletes had never done any of our program um, and uh so it was artificial and quickly became a company with that um, and so in hindsight i wish i had Either put stricter standards down on on what we wanted to do with this company, or maybe not move in that direction, just knowing that's where it was going. Probably should have known that anyway. But I was still caught up in, you know, whether how it would make me look good, like that's your child, or not my favorite time to look good. have this partnership, but I set that aside. You know, that more important ethic, and I, I shouldn't have done that. So. Yeah, I've made lots of mistakes in my career. I you mean, know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of things I think that, that have come up. I remember one time at the, uh, me and, me and my coach at that time were teaching a, a uh, range fitness course with some border, you know, I think of a border patrol, the board cat team or a board star team, which is like, uh, the special forces of border patrol and uh and one of the athletes was struggling to to uh to make the standard shooting and, and this guy kind of had a, a kneeling way of uh doing his kneeling position he wanted to put a knee down and want to brace himself and, and kind of get in a position that we had proven over time time and time again that this is <laughs> results in the best you know, best equipment. He looked really cool doing the way he was doing, but he wasn't hitting the target. And he was getting pissed at me and everything else. And I, and I, I lost it and, uh, you know, kind of went off on this guy. And, uh, and, you know, on the car right back, my coach said, hey, man, that was all about you. You wanted to see how you were good, you know, and you wanted everybody else to see how you were cheering this guy out. And he was right. I was really concerned. I would have took that guy aside and did it that way. So, yeah, there's been many examples in my professional life where, I have not been a quiet professional. It's like a, it's always something you want to kind of aspire to, but it's fun getting better. I do know that, you know, as part of my work right now, I'm trying to distill the idea and thoughts down to, you know, some essence and, uh, you know, some of the work I've done in writing in, this, in the past doesn't fit well. Like even in this essay, some of the, Things I put down there had to do with more how you live your life, not necessarily how you how you behave at work. So there's some things I need to to break down. On. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I think, oh, I think we can go to the. Go ahead. No, you got. If you got something, I was going to transition to the kind of second bullet on this article. But if you got something to add, go ahead. No, go ahead. Let's move on. Uh, 
So kind of the second component, the first being uh, the mission first, second component being hard work with a full heart. So can you summarize that for me, Rob? You know, the, uh, the, my current working definition of a craft professional is uh, commitment to mission and craft, lots of self-promotion. And this kind of gets at the idea of craft. And I've um, been thinking about this and continue to do so on this idea of craftsmanship. As a strength and condition coach, my primary craft, the thing that counts the most in my work, is the quality and effectiveness of the program. And uh, the idea of craftsmanship is, uh, is that you, you love your work. Uh, and so you're, and if you love your work, and not necessarily the achievement of work, but the, the journey and the education of the work, how the work will humble you if you're letting you know constantly how little you know um, and uh, you enjoy the learning part of it, you can really work hard and still have a full heart. You don't work hard with gritted teeth because you're looking to be self-promoted or you're looking uh, to you know show everybody else how um, hard work you are. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the idea that if you can change your relationship to your work from not work but a craft and then fully embrace the idea of craftsmanship, which is continuous learning and learning and an enjoyment of the learning the most, not necessarily the achievement and being open to you, uh, being uh, humbled by your work or your product and enjoying it when you are humbled because you get to learn something. So all of a sudden, it's, it's this idea of instead of at work, you're looking to be self-promoted or recognized, what you get, what you get enjoyment from is, you know, learning about the craft that you're doing and, you know, the improvement that comes along with it. So, it's not dependent on anybody or anything else. It's just you and your relationship with your craft. So in that way, just like putting the mission first, it's liberating. It's dependent on you, which is you have to take that responsibility, but when you do, it's liberating. And then and you you know people like this who work really hard, they're really good at their job, and they do it happily, you know, do it for spirit of teeth, you know. And uh, that's what we all kind of aspire to. I don't know if you guys have this is a tough one. About that. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one. Uh, I think I just did a quick Google set Google search on what percentage of people dislike their job, and it's eighty five percent, which is you know that could be due to a lot of things, but there's obviously a lot of professions that perhaps you fall into instead of chose or you know whatever the circumstances may be but this is a tough one right to me like of all of these all of these lists that you have in this article this is the hardest one at scale because such a huge majority of folks just generally dislike their job for whatever reasons right um, and so that dislike for your job is obviously going to be a massive hurdle to overcome in order to to be able to do this, you know, hard work with full heart, you know, that's a that's a challenging well, I, deal. I don't know if I disagree. I think I disagree with you. I mean, if you dislike your job, you it's entirely within your control to change your relationship with your work. Um, with with the work, you know. Um, well, let me give you an example. Um, I've never known a man, a male, who was happy. Um, but thought he was underemployed. In other words, he, he thought his work was beneath his his talents, what he should be doing. Um, but at the same time, every job has an opportunity for craftsmanship. You don't need to be a woodworker to be a craftsman. You can be a you know a you know, a, a guy who cleans McDonald's can still be a craftsman. Um, and if you are able to understand that, uh, then you can 
that can change the relationship with your job or something that you hate to like, okay, I can I have an opportunity for craftsmanship in this. So what, what can I learn? Uh, I remember this, uh, I don't know where this came from, but it's a long time ago, but if you're bored with what you're doing, learn more about it. And it's, and it's true, I think, that every every job has you know, something that you can you can dig in and learn more about. And, and within that idea of learning is where craftsmanship comes in. So craftsmanship, I think, in my mind, kind of begins with this idea to want to learn and really enjoy the learning. I don't know if that answers into your question, but I mean, it's like happiness can be a an attitude, so you don't necessarily need to be miserable at work. You have a within your mind to change that. And if you're bored at work, you're thinking, okay, you can still, you can still, you know, make the conscious of it, learn more about your work. And I think you'd be surprised how much opportunity there is for learning, no matter what the work is, what the job is. Like I remember my, when and one of my sons was bad mouth and going to work for. Well, uh, convenient, uh, I think it was a fast food restaurant. And I was like, man, I'd be so excited to work for that. Maybe it wasn't a thing else. I can't remember, but I mean, I'm really curious you know, about how efficient they do. You know, how do they, how does the organization work? You know, how does it, you know, how they, you know, they're just so, I mean, a deep dive on, any time that we've taken a deep dive on a certain subject, you just approach it with a curious attitude. I mean, it's always interesting. Go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, I was just curious to, um, to like being like a a craftsman grinding away at it. Has that ever has that ever affected like personal life and family because of of how focused you are on on one aspect of the work you're doing, or how do you how did you like manage that? Yeah, I guess I don't believe in uh, in work-life balance. I don't think it's it's really like that. You're going to spend more time at work than you with your family. And uh, yeah, a conscious decision to to grind and be a craftsman in your work and do the best you can, you know, means you're going to be putting in long hours. And I think that uh, every every craftsman who's really aspired to that has has just done that. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, but again, I think uh, I've thought about this a lot and the difference between men and women. And again, I think that a, a man who feels he is underemployed uh, or isn't being a craftsman at work and is trying to make up for that by being a, a great father, I think there's always a sense of emptiness. I just, I've never met a man who, again, thought he was unemployed to work, who wasn't miserable. And I think that transferred over to how good of a father he could be. Um, whereas for women, I, I haven't seen that as much. And uh, I, I'm not too sure why that is, but I think that that motherhood is, is different than fatherhood. And, and motherhood, you know, many women have given up their work life to be mothers and have really enjoyed that. And I don't think that a man would ever, my, my sense is that men wouldn't have the, the same fulfillment from, from being a full-time dad. I could be wrong, though. there's certainly are exceptions, but I, mean, I don't know if that's a societal thing or men are supposed to be providers or you get yourself work from the work that you do. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's something that at least I haven't observed it. It what happens, but yeah. So what that means for work-life balance is exactly right. You're not going to be, you know, I work I always work long hours, especially when I was your guys' age. My, you know, my father, you know, father suffered. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and would you? So I mean, that's kind of interesting. Would you say any regrets on that? I don't know. I mean, would I have been, if I didn't have a job that was challenging me, I would give it a follow that I was being if I was miserable all the time. I see those guys, 
you know, at the at the bar every night before they go home, you're drinking with their buddies, right? Instead of going right home. So I don't know. Again, I, the question is whether or not you can be um, a good father and not be happy at work. And I think that being happy at work is is partly uh, is partly not only enjoying the actual work you do, which is an attitude, uh, but also putting a lot of effort into it. So, no, I'm not, I'm not sure if, it, if it's possible. So I think that, again, in my experience, personal and kind of what I've seen from, from men I've known is that, again, if you're, even if you get, you know, you're working great hours, and, you know, everything else, if you're not, if you don't think that you're, Contributing at work and, and some of those worthy of talents so or whatever that you, it, it, it moves over to you. You're not, you're going to be miserable and that miserable, you won't be able to hide it with your family. I, I could be wrong. What do you guys think about that idea? I mean, have you ever had a job and just fucking like hated or, or again, or thought you're unemployed at work or something and, can go home and switch that off and be a great dad? Or was it always in the back of your mind? You can take that one first, Kelson. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's kind of a sticky subject. I would say like, there's definitely, I've spent a lot of, a lot of time putting my, my job before my family. And that's just, that's, that was just kind of the requirement. It's, it's really, it's difficult to say. And, um, you, you don't want it to be that way, but in order to, to accomplish some things and, and be safe and, and get the job done, you, you know, sometimes they're, they aren't the, on the top of the list of priorities. So it, it's unfortunate. So I'm trying to, I'm changing that now. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see how that works out for you. In uh, you know, in five years, or are you just one of those guys who's wired to need to have work be a really you know, you know, great component, you know, or in two years or something. It'd be interesting to see. Certainly, yeah, so it's an interesting deal when. Go ahead. Well, it's just an interesting deal when, um, you know, I think military, fire, law enforcement. And the mountain professions too, those are really high stakes professions, right? So the the consequences of not being good at your job are dangerous to your life and the lives of those around you. And so that obviously increases the uh, the consequence of not doing this, right? The opposite side, I mean, I've worked for a big, one of the biggest um tech companies and it was a pretty fucking miserable experience. I really disliked it. Um, and not only disliked it, but, you know, found myself, my attention waning and, you know, you, you fight through that because you have to, because, you know, being the provider for the house and all that kind of stuff, um, for your family. But when, I think particularly in these kind of very large institutions on, on the business side, it can become pretty mind numbing pretty quickly. Uh, particularly if your product or service or whatever, whatever you're selling or supporting is uh, not consequential. Right. Uh, so those, that's a challenge. Right. And I think ultimately like the right answer is, yeah, like you should, what this is all around, what this is all about hard work with a full heart that's that is the way to do it if you can adjust your attitude around it but uh i mean there's a lot of bullshit flying at you and you don't care about the products or you don't care about the service uh that makes that's a big obstacle to to get around so it's you know it's tough this isn't it this isn't an easy deal what what the idea uh aspiring to be quite professional does if you embrace it is that it gives you you know there's a stoicism element here which is 
it gives you this incredible liberty to decide for yourself your relationship with your work. Um, and, uh, and, and so and all of a sudden, the bullshit with the organization or if you have a bad boss or whatever, all that can be set aside and not pay attention to if you're able to embrace this idea and deploy it. So there's a, liber a liberty element to it, just this freedom um, that is a little counter, well, it's quite a bit counterintuitive, but the liberty idea of it is what really appeals to me, for sure. So even that one example you gave, Charlie, is that, you know, you can, you can still be male, hard work with that, you know, with the, you know, good heart and, uh, and work in an organization that you have issues with. We ran a survey. I can't remember what the exact topic of the survey was, but I remember the feedback was, you know, just a lot of people, uh, in this kind of scenario where perhaps they didn't necessarily enjoy their job or weren't interested in their job, still took a lot of pride in being able to provide a, a good life for their family. Um, and so I, you know, I guess ideally the ideal, the ideal mix is you're interested in your job. You're able to, do this work uh, and have it be intrinsically redeeming and also be able to provide a good life for your family. Um, so if you've, I guess if you found both of those and you've done it, right? Congratulations. So that, I think that's often not, not the case. Yeah. I'm not, you know, on the, especially on the mountain professional side, you know, for example, mountain guides, who work in Jackson, they're actually are some of the highest qualified you know, guys in the world in their contract, right? And some are contract employees, they don't make a lot of money. So they, and they struggle with, many of them have struggled with being able to, you know, buy a house in Jackson, provide for the family, still, you know, work within their craft. It's, it's hard to do, it's not possible. And so, yeah, I think that that's just uh, something that comes up. I mean, how do you how do you address that? When do you, as you know, if you want to provide for your family, which is I don't know if women think about they want to provide for their family, but most men do, right? We do. When do you step away from a craft or a work area that you really love to do something that you don't know if you love or not to be able to provide for your family? I'm sure, I'll be know that like several of the guides I know, you know, into that this top guide in and then went to you know when 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 went to school, became a teacher, another one, you know, went into medicine, became a PT. And so they, they still guide a little bit in the summer, you know, but they they don't they don't depend on it to make money. They they be able to keep their toe in that world, but they can't be in it like they they used to be because they and just economically distant numbers. But that's separate than being a quiet professional, I guess. That's some bigger life decisions. Yeah. Life's complicated. Lots of decision points along the way. I guess if you can find yourself in something that's going to be redeeming for you, though, and develop that craftsmanship with a full heart, you probably on the right path to some degree of happiness, right? Okay, start talking about accommodations. Let's talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, any saved rounds on this, guys? Nope. All right, sounds good. Well, thanks for listening today. Feel free to email us with uh, anything you want us to chat on and take a look at it.